the last time we met we derived the small signal equivalent of the oops Last time we met, we derived the small signal equivalent of the MOSFET. It consists of a couple of current sources and a conductance between the drain and source. Now, this is only the DC small signal equivalent of the MOSFET, and as there is no DC into the gates, the input impedance is infinite. Okay. <coughs> what we had was this. There are two control sources corresponding to the transconductance from the gate and the transconductance from the bulk. Okay. So And we can easily derive the expressions for GM and GDS. I think that also we already did, right? So, GM will turn out to be mu C ox W by L VGS minus VT. Okay. In terms of, uh, if you want to express it in terms of VGS. The same thing can be written as 2 times mu C ox W by L times the DC bias current flowing through the transistor. So, each of these expressions will be useful in different contexts. Okay. Sometimes when you are evaluating trade offs, you want to compare things for the same VGS or for same ID or in some other condition. So, all these expressions are useful. You have to be careful about which one you use. Right. And the same thing can also be written as Two ID by VGS minus VT. So you have to be aware of uh, which one to use one. And if you look at the first one, it looks like it's proportional to VGS minus VT. If you look at the last one, it looks like it's the inversely proportional to VGS minus VT. Why is that? ID is proportional to VGS minus VT square. So each of these reflects a different context I mean maybe you are thinking of a constant ID and changing VGS minus VT by changing the size or you are thinking of a given MOSFET that is given geometry and changing VGS minus VT or the current. So, in each of those conditions you use different expressions. Okay. It is good to know all of these things. Now, GMB is has some dependence on. Uh, so, ID is mu C ox W by 12 VGS minus VT square. Okay. What will this be? What is it going to be? So, first of all, where is the dependence on VBS? It is only in this, right. So, you differentiate with respect to VT and then differentiate VT with respect to VBS. So,
okay so that's what it's going to be and this quantity is also negative if v b s increases v t reduces okay so the overall expression comes out to be positive and the direction we have chosen for the control current source is the correct one it goes from drain to source okay so it turns out that the, i mean first of all this is a dimensionless quantity okay it's a ratio of uh, voltages okay so this is basically some uh, multiple of gm so maybe i don't know what the common expression used is but i'll just use let's say a okay and a is uh, somewhere between like 1/3 and 2/3 or something in most technologies okay typically so it depends on that uh, substrate constant gamma in the expression for vt okay vt itself we know is vt not plus this whole thing right so from this we can calculate the derivative okay so it will be some fraction of gm uh in some cases you would want this to be very small in some cases actually a large value helps we'll see that later okay essentially this a is a fraction that denotes the control of the channel from the gate and from the back gate basically it's the ratio of the control from the back gate to the ratio of the control from the gate essentially gm represents uh, gm is the proportionality constant for the increase in current when the gate voltage is increased and gmbs is the proportionality constant for increase in current when the bulk voltage is increased okay i mean normally do you think of mosfet as a three terminal device having only drain gate and source then you would want a to be small basically the bulk should not have any influence on the drain current okay but we have to live with it and it is not very small either it's maybe some significant fraction definitely more than 0.1 typically in cmos processes so we'll have to live with it and we'll also see later that in many cases this helps out okay having a having a larger value of the bulk transconductance okay what is this first of all from the expressions we have so far uh, we have even ignored the dependence on vds okay so id itself should have lambda i mean vds dependence in it so the derivative with respect to vds will become so clearly this is an approximate expression you say that it is lambda times the bias current okay now lambda itself is inversely proportional to the length of the transistor so for a given drain current if you want to control the drain conductance gds you have to change the value of lambda which means that you have to change the length of the transistor okay so again i am assuming all this is familiar so i am going a little fast through the whole thing okay is it okay in the dc small signal picture we have three elements the transconductance the bulk transconductance and the drain to source conductance we know the expressions for all of them the transconductance depends on the drain current and the geometry of the transistor and typically the bulk to bulk to channel transconductance that is some fraction of the transconductance from the gate okay and the fraction can be maybe it's not even 1/3 it's 1/4 or so okay 
something of the sort. It's in some range. It depends on the process. If the bulk doping is very high, then this will also be high. If it is low, it will be lower. Okay. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. It is absorbed in? Yeah. The, this is negative and this DVD by DVBS is also negative. Okay. When you increase the bulk source voltage, the threshold voltage reduces. Right. So, that uh, gives you a positive constant A. So, if you look at this expression, as Vsb increases, Vt increases. So, that means as Vbs increases, Vt decreases. Okay. Any questions on any of these things? Should be very comfortable in deriving the small signal equivalent and using it because we do it all the time. In every analog circuit, we'll have to do this. Okay. So we now have the DC picture of the transistor in large signal as well as a DC small signal picture. Okay. Now before going on to the AC small signal picture, I'll first deal with the mismatch as it relates to the MOS transistor. We've already seen. Uh, what mismatch means in resistors and so on. In case of a resistor, it means that you fabricate a number of identical geometry resistors. They will have slightly different values. Here I am talking about random mismatch, right. They will have slightly different values and how different they are is characterized by a distribution. That distribution is typically Gaussian. It is Gaussian and you have a certain standard deviation and the standard deviation is inversely proportional to square root of the area of the device. Okay, and exactly the same was the case with the capacitor. So you fabricate a large number of capacitors; they all have slightly different values. And again, that distribution is characterized by a Gaussian distribution with a certain standard deviation. And the standard deviation is smaller; uh, it goes as inversely as the square root of the area. Okay. Now, how would we characterize the uh, mismatch in a MOS transistor? Essentially, if you have a model with a certain number of parameters, every parameter can be mismatched and some of those parameters, the mismatch in some of those parameters can also be correlated with each other, okay. But what we will do is to uh, simplify the whole thing. We absorb all of this mu C ox W by L into a single constant beta, let us say. and write the expression for the drain current as beta by 2 Vgs minus Vt square. So, in this case we have only two constants the threshold voltage Vt and the current mismatch beta sorry current factor beta. So, each of these can be mismatched that is you fabricate a large number of identical transistors and you can measure Vt and beta for both of them by measuring the characteristics. Okay. If you do that, it will turn out that beta will be slightly different for all of them and also Vt will be slightly different for all of them. So, again we can characterize each of these using a Gaussian distribution with a certain standard deviation. Okay. The standard deviations of these quantities are denoted by sigma beta and sigma vt. I will let I will explain what each of this is in a moment. Okay. Now, previously what we did was we characterized the mismatch as a relative mismatch, right. When we said sigma r that was really the error the resistance minus the ideal resistance divided by the mean value of the resistance. Okay. It was the relative value. Now, in case of beta that is what we do if the ideal value of beta is something this sigma beta represents the standard deviation of the relative mismatch. In case of Vt 
it doesn't make any sense to make it a ratio of vt okay so it is represented as some mismatch in the voltage itself it's not relative to the mean value of the vt it is a mismatch in the voltage okay i'll again explain why it doesn't make any sense to use the relative value right but the sigma vt is in volts it's just a, if you plot the distribution of vt and you find the standard deviation of that that is sigma vt whereas in case of beta you measure lot values of beta you see the deviations in beta you normalize that to the mean value of beta and you find the standard deviation in that that is the that is sigma beta okay this is the standard deviation of whereas sigma vt is standard deviation of vt itself why does it not make to, why does it not make sense to measure sigma vt as a relative value relative quantity why don't we normalize it to the mean value of vt why what might be the reason yeah 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 that's correct it's not straight forward to get the if you take the relative value you'll we'll again have to multiply it by vt to find the uh, actual mismatch anyway so also see the vt is some nominal value which is positive for enhancement transistors yeah. negative for depletion transistors it can even be zero for some transistors so it if if the mean value of vt happens to be zero then it looks like it, the mismatch is infinity which doesn't make any sense either right so it's because of this vgs minus vt type of dependence that it doesn't make any sense whereas if it was a factor certainly it makes sense to measure it as a relative mismatch because ultimately what we are concerned with is the current mismatch you bias two transistors at the same current how much do the currents differ okay so for that the in that expression the if you have an error in the factor that appears directly okay if you have an error in vt it has some a little more complicated dependence we will work through that now but uh, it certainly the v, delta vt by vt that is not the thing to measure okay so is it okay the nominal value of vt can be anything so depending on uh, if it's very low it looks like artificially looks like the mismatch is very large although the effect on the transistor current is not proportionately large okay again to measure each of these things you how would you measure uh, beta and vt if you are given a transistor and given access to a lab how would you measure beta and vt Huh? Yeah, you like you plot the characteristics in saturation region, and from there you plot square root ID versus VGS. You get extrapolated to get VT, and then the slope of that gives you beta and so on. Okay, so that's how you do it. Now you do the same thing for maybe thousand transistor on a chip, and you measure the standard deviation that gives you delta beta by beta mean as well as uh, delta VT. Okay. so you get the distribution for uh, the current factor as well as the threshold voltage and from that you can calculate mismatch in each of these so sigma vt beta and sigma vt is given to you no sigma beta itself has as usual inverse square root dependence on the area okay you can again derive this you can put two mos transistors in parallel that will double the area of the mos transistor and you assume a sigma beta for each of them and work out the effective sigma beta for the entire transistor you will get it to be inversely proportional to square root of the area okay and sigma vt is also inversely proportional to the 
area of the transistor. So this is in general true of all random mismatch. The larger area you have, the more the fluctuations get averaged out and it has an inverse square root dependence on the area. Okay. So let's say we have a transistor whose ideal values of beta and vt are known, but the actual values will be mismatched by a certain amount. Okay, so there is a mismatch. What will be the standard deviation of the current? So this is this has some mismatch in beta and some mismatch in Vt. What is the ideal value of the current? Hmm? Okay. So, if you have uh, error in each of these quantities. not id naught this is the actual value of id which i will represent as id naught plus delta id okay so this gives you some expression. So, what we will do is we assume that each of the mismatches are small is small and then okay, let me not even do that I will just work through the whole thing completely. So, this gives me Okay. So, the first part of the expression gives me this much. Okay. So, I get VGS, this is the ideal value of the current and this is something related to mismatch, this is also something related to mismatch. Okay. What I will do is, I will assume that delta VT is small compared to VGS minus VT. Okay. So, I can neglect the last term. I will neglect the square dependence on delta Vt and keep only the linear dependence on delta Vt. Okay. So, the first part of the expression becomes okay. Sorry, this is minus. So, I have neglected the delta Vt square term and the second part of the expression will have this. Okay. So, again I will keep only the first order terms in the error. So, when I have a product of two errors like delta beta times delta Vt or delta Vt square I will neglect it. 
because again I am assuming that the mismatches are small, right? So I neglect this and I neglect this. So finally, and what is this? What is this quantity? ID naught. Okay. So I can just write delta ID to be Okay. So the resulting error comes out to be the sum of two terms, one of which is uh, linearly dependent on delta Vt and the other one is linearly dependent on delta beta. So I have neglected all the higher order terms. And this is a very common thing. I think you must be familiar with this. When you are doing error analysis and you have multiple sources of error and each of the errors is small, you calculate the error from each source and then add them separately. Okay. So that is what I have done here. What is this term? GM. So, does it make sense that we have GM here? What's that? The drain current depends on VGS minus VT. So, a change in VT or change in VGS is they are indistinguishable from each other. Okay. A change in VT is uh, equivalent to a, a change in VGS by negative of the same amount. Okay. You either change Vt by delta Vt or you change Vgs by minus delta Vt. It is the same thing. Okay. So, it does make sense that you have Gm here. You have a negative sign because a change delta Vt in the threshold voltage is equivalent to a change minus delta Vt in the Vgs of the transistor. Okay. And what is this? This is just delta beta. Instead of beta, you have delta beta. Okay. It is the current factor. So, the current factor has changed. So, you have the change of the in the current factor times the original expression. Okay. What is the relative mismatch in current? This is okay. I simply divided it by ID naught. This is ID naught. So here also you can see that the mismatch is related to delta Vt, not delta Vt divided by Vt. Okay. So it does make sense to use the absolute value of the error in Vt as a measure of mismatch. And it is also related to delta beta by beta as we expected. That part was clear. So, how would you reduce the mismatch? Is it possible? Huh? Large VGS minus VT. Okay, that's what it looks like from here, right? So, if you have a delta beta by beta is given to you, it is a constant for the process, and it is somehow related to the area of the transistor. But once you have chosen the transistor, delta beta by beta is given to you. Okay. Now, delta Vt is given, but it looks like it has some dependence on the bias also. It has dependence on Vgs minus Vt. So, if you have a large Vgs minus Vt, the mismatch will be less. Okay. The mismatch contribution because of delta Vt will be less. This part you cannot do anything about. Is this clear? I went through it quickly, but it is a straightforward small signal analysis. Rather, we used the large signal analysis and neglected all the higher order terms. So, it is equivalent to small signal analysis. What is the variance of this? It is 
so this is for <coughs> sigma v t square by b v g s minus v t square plus the variance of this. It's assumed that, sorry, this the variance of this is what we call sigma beta. Okay. It's assumed that the mismatch in VT and mismatch in beta are uncorrelated. Okay, that's why we are able to just square the terms and add them up. Okay, so this is a standard assumption used in analysis, and it's more or less true. So we use it all the time. And this was our primary interest to see how much the variation in uh, the current is for a given variation in beta and VT. Okay. So, the standard deviation of beta, the variance of beta comes out right away. The variance of Vt is divided by Vcs minus Vt. Okay. So, I will expand this further. What is sigma Vt square? It is A Vt square by WL. Okay. Now, we can express it as in terms of Vcs minus Vt square or some other quantities also. Okay. I can also express it in terms of Id. Sometimes it's useful to do it for in terms of ID if we are talking about a constant current, not a constant VGS minus VT. Okay. What is VGS minus VT square? It's two ID by mu C ox W by L. Right. So, in fact, this W cancels out and you get a 1 over L square dependence for the mismatch. Okay. So, the next assignment will have some calculations of mismatch. You can do that and after that we can discuss these things further. Okay. So, basically the thing you can take home from this discussion is that the mismatch is related to the length. Okay. If you want to reduce the relative contribution of uh, delta V t to the current error, you have to increase the length of the transistor. We will see that in some other cases also increasing the length of the transistor helps, but the disadvantage of increasing the length is that the parasitics will increase and you will have problems at higher frequencies. Any questions on the calculations we did? This part is clear. So, what we did was to assume that there is an error in uh, beta, delta beta and an error in the threshold voltage delta Vt, plugged it into the expression, expanded it out, neglected all the higher order terms and we were left with uh, this part. Okay. When we normalized it to the drain current, this is what we were left with. Okay. And you can calculate the variance of it and typically that is what you do. You calculate the variance of the error because of mismatch. Because it is random mismatch, there is no meaning in trying to calculate the error for a particular instance of a, a particular instance of mismatch. Okay. You are again interested in if you fabricate a number of transistors, bias all of them with the same gate source voltage, what is the error in the drain current. So, that is what we have calculated. That is the variance of the error in drain current normalized to the average value of the drain current for a large number of transistors. That is related to the variance of Vt and variance of beta in this as uh, given by this relationship. Okay. Now, it turns out that for most uh, uh, most circuit design cases, the variance in the error due to uh, error in the threshold voltage is more important than the error in current factor. Okay. It just happens to be the case. It is not always the case. Depending on the bias condition, you can, I mean, from this expression itself, you can see that you can control the first term by increasing Vgs minus Vt. So, if you increase Vgs minus Vt to very large values, then this may become negligible compared to sigma beta. But I am talking about generally the variance in uh, uh, Vt has a larger effect than the variance in beta. Okay. So, this also says something about if you try to operate with a very small Vgs minus Vt, 
the mismatch can increase. Okay. So, but that statement has to be qualified. We have to actually say whether we are talking about a constant current or constant VGS minus VT or in which case this is true. Okay. Any questions? So, the way we model mismatch in circuits is the model that you have can also include mismatch models, but if it does not it is very easy to include V T mismatch. Okay. We already said that instead of uh, V G S minus V T square being the drain current we will have this part. Okay. So, to model it what we can do is connect delta V T in series with the gate. Now, we should uh, keep in mind that this will be a random quantity, but we can if we want to model it in a circuit and the MOSFET model you have does not include the mismatch models, but has only I mean you uh, the constant A V T is given to you from that you can calculate sigma V T. Okay. So, you can have a small mismatch delta V T in series with the gate simulate your circuit and then do the calculations based on that. Okay. So, this is how you can mis uh, like model mismatch in a transistor or rather a mismatch will earn when you are doing analysis this is also what you use. If you have a V T error that will appear in series with the gate source. Okay. So, you do not normally go and try to write the large signal expression for a circuit and put delta V T in there and then uh, retain all terms except the retain only the first order terms and discard all the higher order terms that is not what you do I mean in fact you cannot do that for anything but the simplest circuits. We did it because we had only a single transistor, but when you have a more complicated circuit the way you analyze the mismatch is by assuming that you have a voltage source in series with the gate source okay. and you assume that this voltage is small. So, you can apply incremental analysis your bias point will be the operating point when this voltage source is 0 and on top of that you have this increment. Okay. So, as a trivial example we can reanalyze what we had. This was our operating point okay. and a certain current I D naught was flowing. Now, we apply an increment delta V T. Okay. So, an increment delta V T is applied between the gate and source. In the incremental picture, this is all we have. Okay. So, the incremental current will be minus delta V T times G M, okay, which is what we got earlier also. Is okay. So, the way you analyze mismatch is by calculate the operating point calculating the operating point without mismatch and then you apply the mismatch quantities which can be modeled as these sources. Okay. Then you do small signal analysis around the operating point. So, the output will have a certain increment and that is the effect of mismatch. and the constants a v t and a beta will be given to you just like a r and a c. So, they are some constants of the process. So, the people who uh, fabricate the transistors will have measured it over a large number of transistors and fitted it to the model fitted it to a v t by square root of w l etcetera and give you those numbers from that for a given transistor area you can calculate the mismatch value. Okay. Is this process clear of analyzing and calculating mismatch.
So one thing I forgot to discuss while discussing the small single model. In strong inversion, whatever we calculated, GM, GDS, all those values are for strong inversion. Okay, we assume square law of the transistor, and then calculated all the quantities. Now, in case of uh, weak inversion, ID will have certain uh, I naught and an exponential dependence to VGS. Okay, so in this case, what is GM? So, this is the thermal voltage. Okay. So, it is almost like a bipolar transistor where it is proportional to I D the bias current divided by the thermal voltage. Okay. In case of a MOS transistor, eta is probably between one and a half and two or something like that. Okay. So, in strong inversion, we also wrote the expression of GM being two times I D by VGS minus V T. So, from this strong inversion expression, it looks like for a given I D, you go on reducing VGS minus V T you will go on increasing gm okay that's what this expression says in fact uh, it says that when vgs equals vt the gm is infinity obviously that's not the case when uh, vgs minus vt is a small value that is let's say below 100 millivolts or so it's no longer in strong inversion the model itself is invalid okay so it slowly approaches this expression and this is the highest gm you can get for a given bias current okay and the value of vt is about 26 millivolts at room temperature and eta may be let us say 1.5 or 2 or something. So, this is the highest GM that you can get for a given bias current that is in weak inversion. So, as you reduce the VGS minus VT the GM goes on increasing for a given bias current. How would you do this? You have to increase the size of the transistor right. So, if you have if you have to have a smaller VGS minus VT and carry the same current the W has to be larger. So, let us say you have a certain size of uh, MOS transistor and you have biased it to get a certain current. Okay? Now, you double the size and readjust the bias to get the same current and then you go on doubling the size and readjusting the bias you can go on doing this. What happens is the transistor uh, VGS minus VT keeps on reducing. So, it gives you larger and larger GM as you are increasing the W, but uh, the increase will not be indefinite at some point it will enter weak inversion and the GM will become constant. Now, it is not no longer dependent on the size of the device. Okay, from this expression, the size doesn't come into picture, right? Once you have fixed ID, that's it. The size is not in the picture anymore. You can keep the same ID, double the size, readjust the bias, do anything you want. The GM will remain the same. This is just like the bipolar transistor. A bipolar transistor's GM is not dependent on its area. It depends only on the current it is conducting. Okay. So to get a larger GM, you have to reduce VGS minus VT, but there is only so much you can do you can move the transistor into the subthreshold region and that's when you get the highest value of gm The last thing before we wind up for the day, the we started with an NMOS transistor, okay. And in NMOS, the definition of the drain is such that the current flows from drain to source. The small signal equivalent is 
we have this controlled current sources from drain to source ok now if we have a PMOS transistor the current is in the opposite direction that is from source to drain ok I will still call it ID but it is from source to drain so what is the small signal equivalent of this why both the current and voltages are reversed in sign so the derivative remains the same ok the derivative with this sign convention remains positive basically VGS is measured like this ok when you when I say I increase VGS I am actually reducing the voltage between gate and source that is I am making it less negative ok so the current reduces so the current going going out of the drain reduces so that is equivalent to an incremental current flowing into the drain ok so this is some very basic thing again you should be familiar with this from the basic course I thought I will just remind you of it so all sources will remain in the same sign the same holds for uh, GMBS VBS also ok Any questions on any of this? Something that is not clear? Yeah. Yeah. For the? Yeah. 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 But the model itself is not valid beyond the certain value of VGS minus VT. So, typically you say that uh, it is the strong inversion is model is valid when VGS minus VT is greater than 3 times the thermal voltage or something right is that that is the I think that is what I remember from device physics that is usually considered a limit for uh, strong inversion if it is below this it is not in strong inversion anymore. So, you cannot use this uh, square law model ok. So, if you use that model even this expression VGS minus VT being whatever uh, 2 ID by mu C of square W by L. So, this comes from the square law model ok. So, from this if you go on increasing W by L VGS minus VT will go on decreasing, but when VGS minus VT reaches about like 75 millivolts or so this model itself is invalid. So, you cannot use this ok. No, there is no linear region in between. So, what happens is in the strong inversion region the it is mainly drift current and in weak inversion region it is mainly diffusion current and there is some uh, moderate inversion region where it is a combination of the two. Modeling in the moderate inversion region is more complicated. So, basically you use the simulator for in uh, such cases ok. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, there is no. No, no, it becomes a more severe nonlinearity, right? So, you have in strong inversion region, you have something proportional to VGS minus VT square, and in uh, weak inversion region, you have ID proportional to exponential of. I can even say exponential of V minus minus V T it is the same thing right it is like a constant ok I will just do it just to keep the same expression. Now, this is a more severe nonlinearity than this it is not like between this and this there is a linear thing. So, if one of the nonlinearities looks like this the other one looks something like this is not it. Where? Oh, ok in the uh, yeah, yeah. So, in each of these cases see both of these are true when 
VDS is greater than a certain value. Okay. In case of uh, strong inversion, this is VGS minus VT. In case of weak inversion, it is again some, uh, uh, I don't know, I have run out of num constants, but some multiple of the thermal voltage. So, if your VDS is below this, then again, it may be linear, it may not be linear, but it will not follow this expression. Okay. So, this, each of these expressions is valid when I plot ID versus VDS, I always get this. When VDS equals 0, ID will be 0. Okay. In either of the regions. And then, the current will increase in some way as I increase VDS and it becomes more or less constant. And that is true in strong inversion as well as weak inversion. So, these expressions refer to this part of the curve. Okay. The saturation part of the curve. So, if you are asking me what the equation is, when it is in weak inversion, but VDS is very small, I actually do not know. It is probably some linear uh, expression. I will have to look up the modeling book to find out. Okay. Huh? One minus e to the minus. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So essentially, it will be exponential of VD minus exponential of VS. That's type of thing. So when exponential of VD becomes very small, or very one of them becomes very small compared to the other, you neglect it. That's why it becomes enters saturation region. That's how it is. So we didn't discuss the symmetrical model, and this is probably not the place to discuss it. But always the drain current of a MOSFET can be written as some function of VD and many other things, but not VS. Okay, minus some function of Vs and so on. So, in saturation what happens is one of these becomes 0. Okay. Now, in when you go close enough to the origin you can model anything like a straight line. Okay. So, yeah these expressions refer to the saturation region and that is where we calculate the GM. Now, when you actually design circuits, sometimes it may go a little bit into triode region and even there you should be able to calculate the GM. Then it is the same thing. You take the model, you differentiate it with respect to the appropriate variable and find the GM. But uh, the assumption here is also that we we have the transistor bias to behave like a current source and that is where we calculate the control current source value also. That was an implicit assumption. I did not really say that, but that is what it is. Okay. When we make amplifiers and so on, we try to keep it in the saturation region and generally we want to calculate the GM in that region of operation. Of course, you can define GM for any region. Once it is a function of uh, VGS, you differentiate it with respect to VGS and you will get the GM. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so tomorrow we will discuss the AC small signal equivalent of the transistor and after that hopefully it will be more interesting circuit design as opposed to sitting and discussing models.